Welcome to a really special episode of The Neuro Show, featuring special guest Dylan Johnson. In today's chat, we go into the expectations for some of the US pros in the upcoming UCI Gravel World Championships, how he's transformed from a YouTuber into a gravel pro, a deep dive into his own training, and we asked a big question, did Dylan Johnson kill the spirit of gravel? All right, let's get into it. I would like to start with the gravel worlds, because, like, Dylan, is this is there some chat? Over there, like, what's what's the what's the gravel bubble scene? Like, are we are we nervous going in? Like, are, are the boys talking about the boys and girls talking about like, are they going? Are they lambs to the slaughter here, or are they backing themselves in for the stripes? Like, yeah, well, that's I that's we're having that same discussion here. Uh, obviously, you know, Keegan is so dominant here in the U.S., but what is he going to do over in Europe? Um, I don't know. We're going to see. I, I wish that I was on the world's team. So I had more insight for you. Uh, you know, are, are they going to work together or is it going to be at, on the U S side? Is it going to be every man for himself? I honestly don't know. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the questions that we're asking. I mean, Keegan, pretty much every U S race that he entered this year, he won. In fact, I can't think of a U.S. race that he entered this year that he didn't win. Um, so he couldn't be more dominant here in the U S and the question is if he goes over to Europe and races this race, that's kind of a gravel race, but it's also, you know, there's a bunch of world tour roadies showing up. What's he got for them? Um, I honestly don't know. Yeah. I, I, so you, you honestly, you honestly don't, I mean, you've been trying to hang on to his wheel for the best part of two years now, okay. like the, the the numbers kind of all suggest that it's pretty comparable. Um, I don't know. I, I kind of feel like maybe this is 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 there is there something here where the, this is a chance for the U.S. scene to like legitimize itself a little bit. Like I know that's probably yeah maybe a little bit naive from my from my perspective. But what do you think? I I think that I, I hope so. But I think that if if the World Championships was here in the U.S. on U.S. gravel on a course that at least some of us are familiar with, I would say absolutely, yeah. It's a chance for uh, U.S. gravel to legitimize itself. If you go up to if you go over to Europe and throw European racers with you know a European style of racing, um, because I I know people have looked at Keegan's numbers and, and said, oh, those are, those are world tour numbers. Um, but it, it goes beyond numbers when you, when you throw him into a pack of world tour road racers and he doesn't even have road racing experience. Really. He comes from mountain bike racing. I, just as an example, he went over and did the world championships road race last year and his his performance was not stellar. I think he was seventy something in place. Yeah, I think he did the he did the Wollongong World Champs, didn't he, Jesse? Yeah, he did. Yeah. So um, what, you said there he's not quite used to the Euro gravel. Is there any? What are the other differences there between pro US domestic gravel and what we're I guess going to call Euro gravel? So I haven't done enough research on the the world's course because I'm not racing worlds. But from what I've heard, it's kind of kind of like riding on a bike path that's or a cinder path or something um it's fairly flat ish um i mean there there might be some climbs that they've added this year again i haven't done enough research on the course uh versus i don't know if you throw if you throw world championship level road racers into unbound for instance uh even if they're at a very high level at the world tour road racing in Europe, there's no guarantee that they're going to win that race. I mean, there's there's so many factors that could destroy a person's race, even if they're a very experienced cyclist. Uh, mechanicals, of course, uh, the heat of Unbound is usually terrible. It's a way longer race than anybody's used to. That's, a, that's another thing about European gravel racing is that it seems like they're doing these shorter races that last three-ish hours, three or four hours. U.S. gravel racing is all five hours plus. There's plenty of gravel U.S. gravel races that are seven, eight hours, and then of course, Unbound, the biggest race here is is a ten plus hour race. How come you're not doing it? Did you apply to get on the team? How did that work with USA Cycling? Yeah, I didn't apply. 
there's just there's but just there was so an, much. There was an application process, an official one. Yeah, there is an application process. I think that if I applied, I could get on the team because looking at the roster that they're sending, there's some riders on there that that I could certainly beat in a gravel race. Um, and I think it was Come just. <laughs> there, it was just it was just a matter of who for example the team that they sent last year was nowhere near our best gravel racers not even close um this year they're actually sending some of our best i mean they're sending keegan and alexi who are currently probably the the first best gravel racer and the second best best gravel racer we have so they're actually sending a legitimate team this year but if if you go on down the list there there are some riders there that it, I, I don't know if shouldn't be there is the right word because they you know they went through the application process and they made it but so you just didn't you didn't want to do it or didn't fit your race program what there's man there's so the u.s gravel calendar is already so busy i i have to say no to so many races and and saying no to the world championships it's like why are you saying no to that um you know, it's smack in the middle of this end of the season that's pretty busy and traveling all the way to Europe and traveling all the way back. I just think that it would affect my uh, my late season races here. So the, the, those top guys, the two guys you mentioned there that are doing it, where do you think this would rank for them in their gravel season? Yeah. Uh, I wish they were on here to tell you. Um, I, it, I, I think that they... I think that they're probably... I don't want to say going for the experience because they want to have the best race that they can possibly have, but I think that they're taking the lifetime Grand Prix more seriously than the world championships. Yeah. I mean, I wonder like financially probably they're because everyone's individually sponsored, right? So you have your, your own your brand sponsors. I would have thought like all their key performance indicators or whatever you want to call them would be lifetime Grand Prix stuff like going and, doing this Euro event doesn't probably still fit in with, with that. I, I don't know. Maybe next year that'll, that'll change. Yeah. I mean, you guys are not wrong when you say us gravel racers are in a bubble. We are in a bubble. Uh, I, it seems like most of the rest of the world doesn't really care or even know what the lifetime Grand Prix is. And here in the U S the lifetime Grand Prix is not only the biggest thing happening in gravel, but I, in my opinion, the biggest thing happening in cycling just in general. Um, so yeah. And, and as far as sponsors go, uh, Keegan sponsors and Alexi sponsors, I, I would think care more about them finishing on the podium at the lifetime grand prix than them getting a top 20 at, at gravel worlds. The lifetime grand prix, the reality of this thing. So there's, there's obviously an elite level to this, the, the elite bubble, let's call it. So how many of you guys are there? There's 35 men and 35 women, and there's a selection process every year. Or I mean, it's only been go going on for two years, but there's a selection process. So if you want to race in the Lifetime Grand Prix series, you, know, you, can't, you, you can't just show up and race the series. You got to you've got to apply and make it in. And it was funny, the first year that they did it, um, they actually got a lot of shit for taking into account social media. Um, and people are like, oh, well, is this a popularity contest or is this a racing <laughs> series? Right. <laughs> so, that. <laughs> so they got, they got a bunch of shit for that. And I think this year, the selection process was much more based on results and performance. So if you get, you get the nod, okay, you're, you're in the lifetime Grand Prix. That's six races across four or five months spread all around the country. Is this, um, this is not something that you can realistically be competitive at as a, um, just a freelancer. Are you, you, you pretty much then are going to be trying to be su supported somewhere from, from a brand, I assume. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be, I can think of, well, uh, I can think of some writers off the top of my head that I don't, I don't know what sponsors they have. They may not be sponsored at all um, by any brands, but it's it's expensive to do the whole series if you're funding it yourself, for sure. I mean, we're probably talking... Expenses to do the whole series is probably talking about $20,000, $30,000. So what's, well, what's, the whole, what's the series look like for you, like in terms of life? I mean, is this... 
we've, we'll talk about the videos and that sort of stuff at some point today, but like, you know, obviously it's completely all encompassing from the YouTube perspective because that's really all you can make is, is content around this, this series. So what, what's the day to day to this? Are you just living in a hotel room for four months? <laughs> Yeah, usually I get Airbnb, so it's not quite a hotel room. But there, there was a lot of time on the road. Uh, I spent two months in Colorado, and that's just to acclimate for for these high altitude races. I mean, half the series is at is at a high altitude, and obviously, being acclimated to altitude is super helpful. Uh, it's funny that you mentioned the YouTube channel and how that relates to the series, because anybody who follows my channel this year has noticed that. Um, I haven't done a science video in probably four months. You know, every video that I've made for the past five videos has been a race report. Um, and honestly, the reason for that is that's about all the time and energy that I have to do right now. Those science videos take quite a bit of work to do. And when you're constantly traveling and racing, it's just that kind of got put on the back burner. I'm hoping to do a little bit more of that in the off season, but, um, yeah, maybe maybe my channel will just kind of be science videos in the off season, race report videos in season. You've made all the science videos, so there's none left. <laughs> I know it's, I'm it's, really running yeah. out of topics. So I'm yeah, gonna be honest. It. We're done. <laughs> On the gravel racing uh, in particular, because correct me if I'm wrong, you're from a more of a road racing background now coming into gravel, so you're not the mountain biker into gravel racer. And this is something I actually, actually I am I'm I, right. I am mountain biker into gravel racer oh, instead of okay. road racer into gravel racer yeah right okay that sort of makes a bit of sense because I was wondering how you got your technical skills up because I've looked at I look at some of these races and even if I was you know wanted to do more racing I would just get ridden straight off the wheel on any descent and I was just yeah how did you improve your, your skills because I'm guessing these top guys are are just almost perfect technically and there's no you have to be able to hold the hold the wheel yeah i mean i would say that there is a there is a difference between the riders that came from road and are doing gravel now and the riders that came from mountain bike and are doing gravel now and usually that is that is the technical skills and um yeah i, I don't want to say every road road racer that does gravel but a lot of the road racers that are now doing gravel um a descent is is a good place to get a gap on them <laughs> you know their their technical skills are usually a weak point um and of course it depends on the race i mean i don't know what the gravel racing is like over there in australia but uh we have we have everything i mean you could have a flat non-technical gravel race that's basically a road race on dirt or you could have a very mountainous very technical gravel race where mountain bike skills are are probably going to be the difference between getting first and being out of the top 10. How, how do you feel you sit skill-wise in the top level of the field? I would say I'm average for a mountain biker, which means that I'm above average for all of the riders in the Grand Prix because half the riders in the Grand Prix come from road. So above, above average for a Grand Prix rider, about average for a mountain biker, I would say. And so did you just kind of go into the deep end, just enter all the races and just naturally try and pick that up through racing and a bit of gravel training routes? Or did you do anything specific for it? I guess if you're coming in with that um, mountain bike background, you probably already had it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that mountain bikers who have been mountain biking since they were either a kid or a teenager have a huge advantage. Because I think some of these skills, when they're learned at a young age, it's almost like learning a, a new language at a young age. You're just at an advantage. Um, uh, that that muscle memory is burned in over so many years of doing it. Of course, descending on a gravel bike and descending on a mountain bike is not the same thing. They're a bit different. Uh, but there's a lot of crossover. So I, do I do anything specific for the skills part? Mm. I mean, I just I just ride gravel. Uh, that's about it. I don't do skills drills. Uh, that, was a very, that was a very Lachlan Morton quote. I just ride gravel, bro. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, <laughs> just a vibe. Oh, actually, the vibe. Can I can I ask you about the vibe? Uh -huh. So, what wasn't wasn't gravel all about vibe? And we're like we're riding oh, around boy. in t-shirts and <laughs> bar bags and like we're drinking Indian pale ales, you know, at the rest stops. And then you come along. And make videos Me, about I come yeah you you come <laughs> along 
<laughs> make videos about, um, I don't know, aero backpacks and all this friggin' stuff. So like, <laughs> I don't know if I have a question or I just wanted to go on a bizarre rant, but like, is, so is, is the spirit of gravel dead and how do you feel about killing it? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, let's spirit of gravel. I think the spirit of gravel started with good intentions and the spirit of gravel was just, Hey, there's this thing called gravel racing. It's a little bit different from road. Uh, and also the, the atmosphere of a gravel race is everybody's just out there to have a good time and it's, it's a party on your gravel bike and that's cool. I, what I think what honestly killed the spirit of gravel is not me obsessing about aerodynamics on a gravel bike. Although, I mean, that was probably part of it, but I think what honestly killed the spirit of gravel is when you had these spirit of gravel police that uh, were ooh. policing what the spirit of gravel was and policing when people were breaking the spirit of gravel. Because as soon as you start doing that, people start rolling their eyes and they're like, okay, I've had enough of this. Um, and yeah, I mean, at this point, uh, if you go to any of these these big gravel races, there are still grassroots gravel races where this is very much the case. But if you go to any big gravel race, um, I mean, it's still a mass participation event and people are just trying to finish and have fun. But at the elite level, yeah, spirit of gravel is dead. We're very competitive um, and we're there to win. We're not there to we're not there to have a good time and wear T-shirts and drink IPA. You, you legitimately like okay there there weren't people with sirens and 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 guns but i i assume like when you say there was a gravel, gravel spirit of gravel police like so you would get a little like nudge on the shoulder and be like yeah come on like what's what's this yeah i mean you know the i don't, I don't want to say that people were explicitly being like oh you're breaking the spirit of gravel but there's just there's just some people in the gravel space that were not happy to see gravel gets so competitive yep. and anything that seemed like you were making gravel more competitive like running aero bars on your gravel bike or wearing a skin suit or doing some sort of race tactic that was real tricky or you know not polling or like uh, name any number of things that could be breaking the spirit of gravel there were certain people that got very upset about that Usually on See, social, it was usually on social media. It wasn't in person. <laughs> Jesse, you kind of have this, I don't know if, if, how do I say this? Um, there's, you have this sort of belief or understanding that maybe going to gravel is, is soft. Is that, is that a fair, fair comment? Like you've, you've kind of, uh, how do I, I mean, you, maybe you've kind of given up. You're. Let's hear it, Jesse. You're not going to offend me. If you're a roadie that goes to gravel because you couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it because... is, but it's not, it's, it, it is. No, okay. Probably not soft, but, and it's actually probably a smart decision financially for a lot of Conti sort of, okay, maybe you just got onto a pro Conti team and then, you know, doesn't really get going like Eva Slick. Sort of a mediocre, well, not, okay. I'm saying mediocre in a, a, you know, world tour scheme of things. He was a sort of a mediocre Conti rider turned big fish in gravel. I mean, is that a soft? Is, is it softball? Yeah, you couldn't make it in world tour, so you went to gravel. But by all means, that's a <laughs> fantastic decision. But it is. It, it, it's kind of a little um, safety net underneath all the Conti riders. Uh, because if they... It's a little... Do I want to say easier? Oh, it's less political and less. you need less connections, I would say. Um, because if you get a result at a gravel race, you'll get noticed. That's not the same on the road. Maybe that's that's my opinion on it. You know, I, I Jesse, I'm actually a little bit in agreement with you. I think that there's, there's some World Tour road racers who came to, and they weren't necessarily doing anything crazy on the road because... Obviously, World Tour road racing is the most competitive that cycling is. Um, and then they come to gravel, and all of a sudden, they're a big fish in a small pond, right? Uh, they're getting huge no notoriety that they never got when they were racing road. And they're probably making more money than they were when they actually were a World Tour road racer 
um, even though they're doing a, a less competitive discipline of cycling. I think that, and so, so many U.S. cyclists recognize that, that they all jump ship to gravel. And in the U.S., if you're not at the World Tour road level or you're not at the, the uh, World Cup mountain bike level, if you're a domestic level U.S. racer, I actually think that it's gotten to the point where, and some roadies are going to get pissed at me for saying this, but I actually think that gravel right now at the Lifetime Grand Prix level is the most competitive discipline of cycling in the U.S. Um, it, it Road is slowly dying. XC mountain biking is is basically dead at this point in the U.S. And the the Lifetime Grand Prix is where all those roadies and mountain bikers went. That's yeah, that is kind of true. Yeah, see, we haven't we haven't seen that yet, have we? I mean, we, we're still in this phase. I was saying this to you a little bit earlier, like where okay, the road scene is quote unquote slowly dying, but the 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 gravel scene is still very much the mass participation. Like the one over the weekend, which was gears and beers, I think it was called in Wagga, and it was. It's it's like a you know you, there probably were IPAs at the drink stations, and so we're you know may, maybe Australia is where the the true spirit of gravel is is taken hold potentially, but yeah, like Give we, it we five certainly, years. yeah, exactly. <laughs> we we are not at the phase where like some of the young guys that Jesse is coaching, like they're not if they're they're wanting to quote unquote make it, they're not trying to make it to the lifetime Grand Prix. They're trying to make it onto a like Conti team or something like that. So I don't think we've we've kind of reached that. No, uh, it's I'm starting to see a few guys. That are now privateer gravel pro trying to probably going to go to the US. It's just like this year, literally 2023. It's just started. So, so in the Grand Prix, uh, there's three Aussie riders, um, and from talking to them, it seems like they came over here because there wasn't enough either gravel or mountain bike racing in Australia. Uh, but are there, are there guys racing and racing gravel in Australia who are actually making a living or, or is that just not a thing? A pro gravel racer <laughs> no. is not a thing in no. Aussie. No. No. Not even, no, it, 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 there's no one, there's, mm, oh, okay. Big call. There is no one making money racing bikes in Australia across anything. Correct. To, to make money racing bikes in Australia, you leave, need to leave Australia. Now, there, there, is, there is a method to get on a – there are continental – UCI continental teams in Australia where you do get the opportunity then to race in Asia or in Europe on the, in the road scene, and that therefore will give you the opportunity to be, to be picked up by a pro or whatever continental team to, to then earn a salary. But, yes, the, the days of any – any dom- salaried domestic rider is is well and truly gone. Now, the guys you mentioned, uh, Trekkie, Taz, and I don't know who the third one is, um, but Trekkie's a really good example, like full-time, full-time job um, and was was well supported by um, Trek, but now he's on Giant, but that's a whole other story. Um but still, that was that was just looking after his riding. So certainly not not a salary type thing. And he's he then applied and and had a crack over over there in in the US. How how have they gone? Can we actually have that chat? Because I'd like to I'd like to hear about that. So the it seems like the Australians have really struggled with altitude, and half the Grand Prix races are altitude races. Um, they also seem to struggle at unbound, but that wasn't related to altitude. That was related to the horrendous mud of unbound this year. But the, the altitude races at the beginning of the year, uh, seemed like Tasman and Trekkie were struggling. And, and I, I say struggling, I don't, I don't know what their typical level is because I've never raced them before until they came over here. But, um, from what I could tell it, they, they probably weren't performing at, at what their potential was. And, all of a sudden, this last weekend, we had uh, this, the uh, a round of the Grand Prix, the Rad Dirt Fest. It's a gravel race in Colorado, another altitude race. And they both had their best altitude race of the season. So it seems like they're coming around. I mean, Trekkie got on the podium. I think Tasman was either top 15 or top 10. 
uh, which is way better than they've been doing at altitude. So either it took them three months to acclimate or they're figuring figuring out how to race at altitude finally. Well, Trekkie domestically is 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 very good. Like, I don't know how you even kind of quantify it, but uh, Tasman, not so much. But Trekkie is like physiologically is a freak. Um, the problem is there is a... He would not have been altitude prepared before he went over there's just a big gap in sports science knowledge to prepare for something like that i mean naturally in the u.s i guess like coaches and even athletes will naturally pick it up because you've had guys racing at altitude for years and years and years so some of the methods probably just naturally spread throughout the race throughout the competitors and the coaches but in australia there's there's no there's no altitude races so no domestic coaches except for, you know, maybe ones that work at an institute of sport are going to know how to prepare an athlete for altitude just because it's not a constraint they have to race. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I live on the East Coast of the U.S., so I don't, I don't actually live at altitude. And um, a, lot of, a lot of East Coast, or, or it doesn't have to be East Coast, but a lot of U.S. racers who don't live at altitude hate the fact that there are so many big U.S. races at altitude. And the reason why there are so many big U.S. racers uh, races at altitude is because it seems like most uh, super competitive cyclists live in Colorado and you know there's usually a national championship there and uh, it's it ever since I've been a competitive cyclist having a national championship in Colorado has been a huge controversy amongst East Coasters but um, yeah I mean I think the fact that so many fast U.S. cyclists live in Colorado, Utah, or some other altitude means that U.S. racers either, you know, they're they're well aware of how to deal with altitude uh, if they've gotten to that level. You're right. Like so many of those events are up there. Just adds to me so many barriers to entry for just the average punter. And that's always the thing that blows my mind with the popularity of these events. I get the hype. I get that. And I, I think I chatted a little bit about about this with Tyler, like I, I just put myself in that position and I go, right, okay, so I'm going to do six races this year and they're all going to be interstate. They're all going to be, and I'm not on a team. I, I, I Maybe I'm an age grouper, right? Um, it just seems like, like I, get, I get myself prepared. I'm going to need all the gear, but I'm going to have to have different gear for the different races because I've watched Dylan's buddy video and he's got a frigging drop bar on his mountain bike. Oh shit. All right. I'll go to the bike store and get that changed for that race. And then I can do all that stuff. And then I've got to acclimate to bloody altitude. And I'm like, there's another barrier for me to do well. So I don't know whether it's just a US mentality thing of like, no, whatever. I'm just going to go and do it, suck it up. But for me personally, I just feel like, yeah, there's just so many steps for you to, 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 to come away from the event and go, you know what? I got, got everything out of myself there. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. No, I mean doing doing super well at Leadville, for example. I mean the the entry fee is already astronomical, but then take into account that you probably have to get a hotel or an Airbnb there for a month beforehand to actually do well there. I mean, it's probably one of the most expensive races to perform well at in the U.S. Uh, and that was also that was also a controversy this year with Unbound. Uh, Unbound's not an altitude race, but the fact that the mud destroyed everyone's bikes, it's like, okay, the pro the pro riders are getting free bikes, but what about all the age groupers that, you know, had to spend five five to ten grand on a bike and now it's completely destroyed. Is there is there any is there anything nefarious happening in this in this gravel scene, Dylan? Like, can we can we can we delve into this? Is there is there any testing of any variety going on do you know yeah so uh, this is this has been a huge topic of discussion on on bonk bros uh every time keegan dominates a race i think we have this discussion a little bit uh, uh there is testing at the grand prix but it's at race testing uh it's not a biological passport or anything like that um Although I think that Keegan is still on the USA Cycling testing pool, so he does get tested. Um, and you know, as far as the lifetime grand prix testing goes, though, like I said, it's at race testing, and uh, I mean, I've been doing just 
take me my personal experience as an example. I'm I'm not I'm not in you know I'm not usually on the podium. In fact, I've never gotten on the podium at a Grand Prix race. So this is just kind of a, a mid pack Grand Prix riders perspective for you. But I I have never gotten tested at a Grand Prix race, and I've been doing it for two years. So <laughs> oh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> and there's only 35 men in it. Jesus. Yeah. So 70 riders total that they would have to test. Oh, that's scary. The reason why I, I put this in the notes, because at least on the outside, it does seem like a bit of a perfect storm for, for doping, because uh, mainly from the riders. So you've got a mix of sort of older school European road riders who have a, are going to have some of the culture from sort of pre- 2013 pre 2014 sort of era so they're probably bringing that a little bit in and then you've got almost worse which is riders that have never gone through a, an institute of sport or an, a, a national governing body and had that anti-doping message drilled into them so you've got the new school privateers who probably don't quite grasp the anti-doping message so you've got those two both those two ends and then you've got a league where there is good prize money in the um, yeah, financial incentive, and you just, and as you've said, lackluster testing, and you just from the outside you're looking, going, oh, I don't like the, I don't, <laughs> I don't like the look of this. Not that I necessarily have. There's no cases I've seen where I'm like, oh, that looks dodgy. Just as a whole, it's it's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's no reason to believe right now that anybody is doping. It's not, you know, there's there's. But, you know, I mean, you take 70 people, I, I personally, I would find it hard to believe that all 70 riders are, are absolutely clean. You know, they're doing, they're not doing a single thing that's on the WADA banned substance list. Well, yeah, statistically, <laughs> it would be quite, uh, especially, yeah, when you have no out of competition testing, that's the real, because that's the real deterrent. And just that in the back of the mind is, oh shit, the testers could come tomorrow morning. You don't have that. I mean, any you know, it, it we've anytime you throw big money into the mix, and and the prize money is one thing, but I, the the way that U.S. gravel races are making their money is through sponsors, just like any cyclist, and the the money that you could potentially get from sponsors for winning Unbound, for example. I mean, if if you go from a no-name cyclist that's not making any money cycling, and then all of a sudden you were to win Unbound. I mean, we're talking about a hundred thousand dollar contract next year with, you know, specialized. Or yeah, can we go into the numbers yeah. a bit? What are we? Okay, let's take out, you know, Keegan, the top person. If we just looked at kind of maybe from the top five to top fifteen, probably for more of a realistic representation. What, what's the sort of salaries and contracts and what? What kind of money are we? Are we talking kind of like allowances or stipends, or are we talking like full time income equivalent sort of level? Yeah. So obviously, the only person who I know exactly what they make is myself. But um, I have I, I being in being in the cycling space in the U.S. I have a rough idea of probably what people are making, and I would say out of out of the seventy Grand Prix riders, I would say maybe half of those or maybe even maybe even more than half are that is their that is how they make a living is cycling um that's how they're paying the bills is cycling so uh i mean that's that's a decent amount and then if we're talking about the you know the top 10 and that'd riders be a combination sorry that would be a combination of of brands coming together for a sort of ambassador type salaries right, right? so most Almost all of us are not on a team where we're privateers of some sort. So you get, you know, you get some money from your bike sponsor. You get some money from your wheel sponsor. You get some money from your kit sponsor. You add it all up and you you can make a living off of that. And I would say, um, I would say that probably, you know, the top five, top 10, uh, there are certainly guys making six figures and... I've heard some crazy numbers thrown out for for the big hitters like Keegan. Um, I I don't know whether they're true or not, but we're 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 talking about some serious money. Can what well, can we, can I push? Can I go a little like you know like when you say six figures, that's it. You know you could be like six figures could be 
take out race expenses and uh, and then you could you could you could be saying a top 10 gravel domestic rider is taking home 100k which is you know a good living but it's not that much money or like six figures could mean they're on sort of a world tour equivalent for a decent rider which might be you know they're on 400k you know like wh- any because we talk a lot about pro gravel and i think there's a definitely a, an an idea that you know the good pro riders are on good money but i'm just trying to like every when when i say good money it really de- like who <laughs> can we get some figures uh, so again i the, the i only know what i make but i would say that probably the keegans the alexi the alexis they are they are probably alexi has said publicly that he's making more money right now as a pro gravel racer than he did when he was on yumbo um now he was he wasn't a very high ranking rider on yumbo so they probably weren't you know throwing him uh you know wout money but (laughs) um obviously but he's he and and apparently keegan got offers from world tour teams after he had such a dominant season last year and he didn't take any of them and I assume that's because he's making more money here racing U.S. gravel. So at the top level, I think the salaries are equivalent to to World Tour salaries. And then there are a lot of people probably living off of, you know, 100000 a year or less than that. I mean, if they're really trying to scrape by as a pro gravel racer, there's there's, pro- there's plenty that are trying to tr- trying to live off of less than 50. Okay, that's so okay, interesting, and it's just the yeah. That see, that's I, I feel like that's less money than the average just punter at home would think when they load up their favorite gravel pro pros Instagram page, and then if they realize that rider was making eighty grand a year, they'd probably be like, oh, oh, that's not what I thought. <laughs> what do you think, Chris? And yeah, as a as a privateer. I'm imagining it's it's like there's less there's like almost less safety net as well because you know okay you came eighth and then next year you came sixteenth well your bargaining chips are halved with your with your sponsors so I imagine like and I don't know whether this comes back to the doping thing but this was kind of where my head was going with it it's like that's so cutthroat at that end when you're being when you're talking about as a privateer negotiating essentially numbers with your with your sponsors and and to make a living off that yeah it kind of would breed so something yeah so let's talk about this though um there are riders like myself who i probably so currently sitting in 17th place in the grand prix and i'm typically finishing between 15th and 20th that's that's my spot out of 35 riders (laughs) right um so a a mid-pack grand prix rider I'm probably making more money from sponsors. I'm not I'm not including YouTube and the coaching business in here. I'm probably making more money from sponsors than I deserve for my talent level because because I'm bringing more attention to the brand every time I make a YouTube yeah, video. Yeah, I, I was going to uh and you, and I'm not you... the I'm not the only rider like that. There are other riders in the Grand Prix who've got a big social media following or they've got a podcast or something and and they're probably making more, you know, I, they're probably making more money than they deserve for their skill level. Uh, and I was going to say that when I introduced this topic, it was you don't count because it's not, it's totally, I can't, no, it's like, oh, count. just like get 15th in a gravel race and you'll make what Dylan makes. I'm like, no, well, he's like a celebrity. It doesn't like, that, that's totally, yeah. And that's not that you don't, I get what you mean by you don't deserve in terms of, I guess, like paid for your actual result but like deserve at a global level 100 percent you do because no one can go and just start a youtube channel and have you know hundred and fifty thousand subs or however many you have now so yeah well let, let's be honest the the reason that this this stuff this even this gravel scene floats into our ether is because of you and that's you know that's the the, the lifetime grand prix zone promotion is does not enter my sort of my feed at all whether I know what the next gravel race is because of Dylan Johnson, not because of, yeah. So sticking on you, Dylan, with this for where you're at now, um, what's your, what is your backstory over the I guess the last 
five years. Were you were you coach turned YouTuber turned now you would just say you're a, basically a gravel pro? Or were you YouTuber then coach? What how did what's the story of Dylan Johnson? Yeah, so I uh when I graduated college I started working at CTS. Um graduated with an exercise science to degree for those who don't know cts is probably the biggest coaching company here in the u.s Uh, so started immediately working as a coach for cts um but interestingly enough you know part of the reason why you would even choose to work for cts or another coaching company as opposed to just starting your own is because uh they are supposedly going to give you all the clients you need and you don't have to do any of the marketing and that's why you let them take a cut right Uh, but I was, I was just a, I was just a contractor for them and I really wasn't getting a lot of athletes from them. And, um, I kind of, kind of, even though I worked for them, I felt like I needed a way to advertise my coaching. Um, especially at the time because I was 20, I guess I was 22 years old and obviously I was a complete no name in coaching, you know? And, and most people probably don't want a 22 year old to tell them what to do. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of did start the YouTube channel as a way to advertise that, but I also wanted it to be a YouTube channel. I, I think in the very first video that I ever did, I told people to subscribe and I had zero subscribers that I'm telling people to subscribe. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted it to be a YouTube channel and I think the fortunate thing for me, because I think a lot of people start a YouTube channel thinking that it's easy and then they realize that it's not and they're not growing nearly as fast as they want to and they give up at a certain point. Fortunately for me, I actually did have a video blow up pretty quickly. I think it was two months into doing YouTube. I had a video about how Zwift training plans are not very good and that video that video blew up and it was it it, it was just after after that set the ball rolling um it was it was i had momentum after that and then um so fast forward from there when did so you just so you're building you you were doing more coaching still making youtube videos then there was a swing maybe a year ago where it looked like dylan johnson was more gravel gravel racer well, how did that come into play? And I mean, do you still coach anyone, or I coach just I, on the business side? Like, yeah, I only coach four people, um, and that's because that those are I don't want to coach more than that. I already have too much going on as it is. Um, but I do have a I, I I'm a co owner of a coaching company, and yeah, I've got we've got sixteen coaches. So if somebody wants coaching, um, I I can set them up with a coach. I know this is, you know, I'm advertising my own coaching on on your guys's coaching podcast here, but <laughs> um, but anyway, this is not so, a coaching podcast, by the way. This is not a coaching <laughs> podcast. So right, you so, so you're telling everyone you're kind of like a coaching pimp. You just kind of like send sure, people out. Sure, you, I've got someone to sort you out. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, so. If you if you only follow me on YouTube, it it would look like I made this transition from I was just a coach and now all of a sudden I'm a pro racer. Like when did that happen? Like how did you go from a coach to a pro racer? Usually, if anything, it's the opposite. People go from they were a pro racer and now they're a coach. Uh, the truth is, I mean, I've been I've been racing at a competitive level since I was you know I don't know twelve years old or thirteen years old and. I was very focused on marathon mountain bike racing before I got into gravel. And the the series that I was doing was there's not a lot of publicity and it certainly wasn't as competitive as the Lifetime Grand Prix is now. Um but I was a three-time winner of that series. A, it was called the National Ultra Endurance Series. It was like a national series of 100-mile mountain bike races. Um and I was yeah, I've I've Ever since I turned 18 and I had a I had a pro mountain bike license and I was racing, I guess you could say at the pro level in mountain biking in the US. Um, for whatever reason, I didn't talk about my races that much when I first started the channel. Uh, I guess I guess I just figured that people wouldn't be that interested. Um, 
but I've been proven wrong about that because some of my most popular videos are just videos where I'm talking about a race that I did and people seem to find that fascinating even though I finished like 20th place at Unbound people people want to know every detail so um and then this year this year like I said at the at the top of the show uh I haven't done a science bit with it, people for people who don't follow my channel um almost all the videos on the channel are are science based coaching videos I haven't done a video like that uh in four months it's all been uh race report videos so like I said I think I'm probably going to make this transition where in season it'll be race report videos off season it'll be science videos it's it's pretty unique from from a YouTube perspective, because like normally the algorithm doesn't like that, right? Like, so you've cut your teeth on informative information, cycling, science-based videos. And then it's like, oh, hang on. No, no, I'm actually an elite gravel racer and here's a race report from, from this race. And I know like the way you do it's pretty clever because you still incorporate you know, maybe some equipment chat about what you chose or potentially some discussion about, you know, how you prepared with some some training interval type stuff and how that played out on the day. So there is that. But to have kind of kept the audience or kept the same audience from essentially two different kinds of niches is, I don't know, it's interesting whether it's the same people watching it or maybe it's an entirely different bunch of people watching it. I don't really know the answer. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly crossover because obviously both videos are related to cycling, but it is a totally different type of cycling content. You're right about that. I mean, a science-based uh, training video where you're talking about, you know, what intervals are most effective is is way different and and attracts a different audience than than a race report from Unbound or a race report from Leadville where you're talking specifically about how you're race went there um and even the equipment stuff could could attract a different audience i think there are yep. some people that that call me the marginal gains guy like i'm the marginal gains youtube guy i don't even think that i have that many videos about marginal gains i just have i just have like a couple videos where i interviewed josh Porter from silka talking about marginal gains but there's some of my most popular videos on the channel and and some some people think of me as the marginal gains youtube guy yeah, the guy who killed gravel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah that's, exactly. That's you. That's you. Um, I don't know this whether this is a segue, but I really wanted to ask you this. I've been wanting to talk to you about this, and this is so niche and so navel-gazing. I'm sorry to everybody, but I'm going to ask you, right? So filming a friggin' bike race. Okay, so there you are. You're against all these pros who are marginally optimized to the absolute nth degree. And there you are with your friggin' GoPro or so I know you've thought about this. You've, you've on the start line, you've probably tried to somehow aero shape the GoPro and you're, you're worrying how many batteries do I carry on? Oh, you know, this is going to add weight to my whole, whole system. Do you think, do you think about this as much as I think you do? And I kind of do a bit when I'm doing this stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it was, I, you know, I'm, such a marginal gains nerd that it does make me cringe a little bit just the thought of having a camera on my bike right because obviously it's more weight it's less aerodynamic it's not it's not helping but so i'll tell you what my solution is here i don't use a gopro because gopros are heavy and they're a square uh, i use a instago uh go to camera so it's a very oh, a little fob mm-hmm so it's a very small camera and it only weighs 25 grams. So it weighs practically nothing. And it's the frontal area of the camera is a lot smaller than a GoPro. Um, so I use that. The The biggest downside with that camera is that it only has 30 minutes of battery, battery life. And I don't replace, I don't replace it mid race. It doesn't even have a battery. You just have to charge it. Um, so I have to be very selective with what I film. Uh, and I have it on a setting where it'll film for 30 seconds and then automatically turn off because if it didn't, I would totally screw that up. So I have to be selective with what I film and 
because of the length of these gravel races, usually I end up missing the last two hours of the race, which is unfortunate. Um, but I, it's, it's worked decently enough for the kinds of videos that I do because I don't do a voiceover where you see everything that's happening in a crit. Uh, I just talk about my race and then selectively put clips in that I think, you know, correlate to what I'm talking about. Sometimes I'm talking about how somebody attacked and I throw in a clip of somebody else, you know, a, a different time in the race when somebody was attacking, but no one knows that. And it, it looks like an attack, so good enough so I, I i sometimes watch it and i'm like that's b-roll from a different race i swear that's <laughs> a different race or the other one which i've done in the past which was have someone film me the day before or the two days before like in the race kit like on the same course because we might have been pre-riding or whatever and i'm like just film a bit of this and then use that footage in it and just you know dop it in as a bit of b-roll about you know what happened during the race i'm guilty Good. Guilty of that. For I'm sure. glad. I'm glad you've made you've made my day by by thinking that it's it's something that I kind of thought about. Though I did I did kind of like, and I mentioned this a few like Tyler's idea of of getting everyone in that top thirty to actually have a camera on and just completely level the playing field, and then going that route to get some content out of it. So you know what was so interesting the. Interesting for me as a YouTuber and a bike racer is the thought of, and, and Tyler brought this up in when you interviewed him, um, the thought of somebody with the talent of Keegan Swenson, but the, the YouTube skills of Tyler, right? So somebody out there who, who is making YouTube videos to the quality that Tyler is making them and actually winning a Grand Prix race that channel would blow up. It would be insane. Yeah. Do you watch much cycling I mean, YouTube, Dylan? Who do you watch? Um, well, I occasionally watch the Nero show. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I've actually, I've watched a couple of your videos. Um, it was so funny when somebody brought up the Nero show on the Bob Pros podcast because Drew, as you, as you guys heard, Drew is not a fan of your videos, Jesse. I, I, I think they're fine. I, I, it's what's, what's so interesting to me is YouTubers who, and you can tell me if you actually do this or not, but YouTubers that it looks like all they do is turn on, turn on their webcam and then they just talk for 15 minutes with no script and then they turn it off and that's their video, which is the vibe that I get from you because my, my videos are not like that at all. They're heavily scripted. I'm glad you got that vibe. That's just my good editing. Cause I, I have never done a single take video. I just cuts all like a gazillion cuts. Yeah, <laughs> that's definitely that. It's just, but just in the type of video, um, I've said this to Chris on the show many times, there would be no value in remaking a Dylan Johnson video. It's been done. There's not, that's the, yeah, you've no, gone through the, the biggest studies. So are you kind of, if you want to do a training or, you know, training or coaching related channel, you kind of got to do something different. So I'm, Yes, mine is tends to be more experience slash personality based. But yeah, that's because you <laughs> you ruined the science based training videos by doing them so well. well. I, I appreciate that. I mean, there is there is only so much cycling science that you can talk about because it's not one of these areas where there's a new study coming out every day. You know what I mean? Um, it's not like you can constantly be talking about new science and. And I'm going to be honest, there, there has come a point where I feel like I'm struggling to find ideas for videos um, mm -hmm. on the science side. Obviously, the race reports, it's just I do a race and then I talk about it and it's easy. But coming up with new, new video topics after you've done so many uh, is quite challenging. Uh, just, just to keep this personal, I have one more little anecdote. I actually find it hard. Okay, it's, maybe it's not as, as time intensive as a video like you do where you're you're probably spending hours or days making a script with all the research and basically doing a literature review like you do at university so it's definitely not as time intensive but to put out a video where you're just basically putting out your opinion or just experience from a coaching point of view is actually mentally a little hard because it's quite easy to shut down because anyone can get in the comments and just say look at this study, you're wrong because you said that, or where's your evidence for that? 
So, yeah, it's definitely uh, quicker to make a video and not as time intensive, but you then kind of, you are leaving yourself open to um, basically everyone else's opinions because it, it then just becomes a piece of opinion. So so this is this is a YouTuber question. How, how do you guys deal with the, the negative comments? Because obviously you get to a certain point in YouTube and you're going to have negative comments. I don't read the... Uh, I try not to read the YouTube comments that much, especially on the show. I, but it's hard because the comments drive some topics for the next show and conversation points. So I kind of, like, not, not joking, when I bring the comments up, I've almost got one eye closed and I'm like, what's the gist? What's the vibe of the comments? And then I kind of just try and get out. Uh, and the Instagram, anything on Instagram, I just do not read any Instagram comments because we started doing the reels and the Instagram comments of when I first started doing the videos, I, at the end of the videos, I would say, oh, you know, leave your comment or your training question in the comments. I'll be sure to answer it. Right. So I was basically, there was basically a promise to my viewers that if you left a training question in my comments section, I would go down there and answer it, which was very dangerous when my YouTube channel actually started getting a lot of popularity because, you know, I can't answer every training question in the comments because then that's all I'll be doing all day, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I stopped doing that um, as I was getting a lot of training questions. But then as far as the... It, most of the comments on my videos are positive, but, you know, every once in a while there's a negative comment. And when it when it's just a generic comment, that like oh trash video or terrible video I, you know I, it's like the youtube algorithm probably recommended to this to somebody who typically watches like uh, you know cooking videos and then they were like oh what's this oh what i don't know what this guy is saying trash video you know um so i i don't i don't i don't take those personally i think the ones the one if i if somebody points so it, it, the I think the ones that that um, well I'll just say that when somebody points out something in a science based video and then they they think that it's incorrect and they actually have good reason for thinking it's incorrect and and um, maybe it's a lengthy comment where they're they're kind of going into why I was wrong about something. I'll actually read those and I'll consider those. And there have there have been times where somebody's comment actually made me think, and I was like, "Huh, you know, maybe maybe I should have worded that differently in the video." I think what you did really well, though. I think I mentioned this is like the backwards hat, Dylan. Like that's it's funny, but it's also clever because you're you're immediately um, identifying because you might talk about a subject and you immediately identify the subject that the negative commenter will hit on and you just make a joke of it and then back to regularly scheduled program. And it's almost like by doing that, you've kind of reduced the ability or reduced the ammunition that the commenter had because all they would basically be doing is like saying exactly what backwards hat Dylan, I hate saying that, sounds so stupid, backwards hat Dylan had said. And it's like, yeah, well, he's, yeah. So it's it's kind of covered that box really well. Can I just quickly say... The one comment that really irks me, and now we get every one of them underneath, will be like, "Oh, you guys are just doing doing this for um, for clicks or something like that." And you're a bit like, "Yeah, we love getting negative comments. That's awesome. I love opening up the app and seeing you guys are dickheads." Like, like unfortunately, our opinions might disagree. You might disagree with them. We're not doing that on purpose. I can. There's no fun in that, I promise. So, what's the it bike in the gravel scene? What's is can I, can I ask? Can I ask Jesse? So, what what is the what's the it bike in the gravel scene? What's the what's the gee? That's a fast bike. Whoa, geez, he's on the uh, woof. like. Is is there anything, or or you're all just talking about tire pressure? Like, what's, oh, what's going on? There's so much tire talk in gravel racing. It's insane. I mean, the, the, the number one conversation that you're going to have with your fellow racers when you go to a gravel race is what tires are you running? Um, as far as bikes go, so I, this is, this is going to sound, this is going to sound biased because I'm sponsored by Factor, but I think Factor is, 
five years ahead of their time with doing an aero gravel bike. They essentially took the the factor Ostro, which is you know an aerodynamic road bike, and they gave it more tire clearance. So it's it's an aero road bike with the tire clearance so that you can run gravel tires, which can be quite stiff and jarring for somebody who's not a racer. But if you are a racer and you want uh, you want an aerodynamic gravel bike, I think it's one of the best options on the market. I think we're going to see more and more gravel race bikes go in that direction. There's going to start, there's, there's going to be a category of gravel bike that is aero gravel bike, just like there's a category of road bike that's aero road bike. We're not quite there yet, but that that's, that's five years in the future that that's going to be a category of gravel bike for sure. Cause I did notice like even, even the big guys are on what I would rel- regard as relatively niche brands. Like, so Keegan's on a Santa Cruz? Am I, no, is that right? Yeah, it's funny that you, yeah, he is on a Santa Cruz. It's funny that you call that a niche brand. Here in the US, I, I wouldn't call that a niche brand. Okay, fair enough. Maybe some, but yeah, some so hate the Santa Cruz, yeah. Sa- Santa Cruz is, and Santa Cruz is more known for their mountain bikes than their gravel okay. bikes. And they're really big in downhill. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of where that brand is at downhill and enduro mountain bikes. They do make a gravel bike. And honestly, it looks like mountain bikers designed a gravel bike when you look at that bike. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, there are certain races where that kind of bike excels, but I mean, you can look at it and you can tell they didn't think twice about aerodynamics. So I've, I've got the, I've got a steel frame vibe of gravel bike here that I've been lent. But I don't think I'm providing full value for the for the guy who lent it to me because I'm not I'm not great at riding gravel, nor do I have much vibe. So I'm kind of considering uh, giving it back to him and and going for something where maybe I do go a, a kind of race orientated gravel rig and and get out get out ahead ahead of the curve. So I don't know the 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 Cervelo is really popular here. Um, it's the Aspire or one of those super popular here. So you are you doing? Are you going to go full time racing again in twenty twenty four? What's the what's the plan for Dylan? Yeah, if uh, if anything, I'm taking racing more serious. I and this is weird to say because I've taken racing seriously my entire racing life. But if anything, my focus is more on racing than it ever has been. And in twenty twenty four, I'll probably do the Grand Prix again, and uh, it'll be. It'll be my main focus during the season. Uh, obviously, I'm going to continue to make YouTube videos, but um, I think that until until gravel really blew up, uh, I was not I was not able to make a living trying to be a professional bike racer. Uh, and at this point, if I stop doing YouTube, well, I say this, but if I stop doing YouTube, my sponsors would not be happy. But <laughs> If if I if I stop doing YouTube and I stop doing coaching, it's it's almost to the point where I could make a living just off of my off of what I'm making from racing. Um, so it's obviously become a big focus for me. Was that always the goal, or are you you there now going, holy shit? Like, I'm actually a yeah. professional athlete. <laughs> like, you're a legit professional athlete. Yeah, I, I mean, I am going holy shit. Uh, but it was a goal. It, I, being a professional cyclist has been a goal of mine since I was probably 15 years old. Um, and there was a time in my early 20s where I thought that that would never happen because I was at a decently high level, but I wasn't making any money. Um, because I mean, I wasn't at the I wasn't at the World Cup XEO level, and I wasn't at the World Tour level for road. I was, you know, I was at the domestic pro level and I wasn't even a very high highly ranked domestic pro rider and so you know maybe I was getting free bikes and a little bit of money for travel expenses but that's about it and certainly not enough to make a living off of so you know if I if I went back and told 22 or 23 year old Dylan the money that sponsors are giving me right now he would say holy shit for sure (laughs) it is wild because you're you're dead right like and we had so many guys like that in the team who were 22, 23, and you you knew at that point whether you were going to quote unquote make it, right? And to 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 have to say to one of those guys, 
four years later, oh, actually now you have, you are now a professional. Like that has not happened, full stop. So it's, it's pretty cool, actually. That is pretty cool. Do you coach yourself? I do coach myself, yeah. I, uh, I feel like I would have a hard time. I feel like I would have a hard time. If a coach prescribed me a workout that I didn't think was beneficial, I just wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, so it would probably make me a hard, I would be a real pain in the ass athlete to coach for sure. I don't know. I don't know if you guys coach yourselves, but I, but I might, I don't, I wouldn't even really say I'm training. But you've all, it, you've coached your, I mean, in the training blocks that you've done for the last 18 months. Yes. No, no. I have coached myself when I was training. So how are you going to bridge the gap then over the next, let's say two years? Because I've, I've seen some of your videos where you review your uh, season and then like little training things that you are going to try and improve. Is it just going to be that, like a, just a gradual process and kind of fingers crossed or any any big changes you can make? Um, so I have been steadily improving for the last, I would say, five years. Um, and sometimes that's not always apparent because in a lot of these gravel races... For example, the first unbound that I ever did was 2018, and I got ninth place, which is my best unbound finish ever uh, that I've ever gotten. And it was by far my worst unbound performance ever. I bonked in the second half of the race and was crawling to the finish line. And I think my time was 11 hours and 40 minutes or something. So... Contrast that with last year where I got the fastest unbound time that I've ever gotten. It was 9.58, so just sub 10, and I got 25th place. So what's changed is the level at unbound, right? I've gotten much fitter and much better at racing at the same time that the level of racing in gravel has has blown up. So if you're just looking at the results sheet, you may think that, Oh, Dylan's gotten slower, but that is, that's it's not the case. Um, and and just kind of from a numbers perspective, uh, you know, I I think that over the past five years, it's 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 almost like I've I've added ten watts to my FTP almost every year. Like if I go back five years, my FTP is maybe not fifty watts lower, maybe forty watts lower than it is now. What is your FTP? So. The FTP, the the last FTP test that I did was a 20 minute test and I did 402 watts for 20 minutes. And that was at 69 kilos. Should have, that should have been the first question. I found that <laughs> when I was in the US, when I was in the US, like literally, like it, that had to be asked, like in the first five minutes of meeting someone, you're like, what's your watts per kilo? I'm like, sorry, what's your name? Um, yeah, it's, I, I kind of, I don't know, it feels like, I'm I'm must be really sort of um, precious or something. I feel like it's a how much do you earn sort of question. Like, you know, I don't I don't mind telling. I mean, I already if you watch if you watch enough of my videos, you probably already know what the answer to that is. Sure. I talk about all my numbers from every race and every video, so I'm not I'm not one of these people that's very secretive about my power numbers. So are you? Um, I guess do you treat? Will you be treating? I guess like preseason next year as if you were a prof professional athlete? Like, ha are you going for a four-hour ride in the morning and then having to work for six hours the rest of the day? Or, or does, is this allowing you to have, after, have a nap every day and treat, tr treat yourself as if you are at an institute of sport? Yeah, I would say if you look at my weekly schedule right now, it, it looks like I'm a professional athlete. I mean, I do extra stuff. Like, I do a, a little bit of coaching and I do the YouTube channel and the podcasts. But for the most part, if you're looking at what I'm doing day to day, it looks like I'm a professional athlete. And going going back to the the question that you had, like, what are you going to do to bridge the gap? You know, you're sitting kind of mid-pack Grand Prix rider right now. Like, what are, you know, what are you going to do to improve on that? Um, I think that the fittest that I was this year was around the time of Unbound. I had, I had three great race results uh, around the time of Unbound, one one was Unbound itself, but I think that that general time period was I was I was incredibly fit during that time. And what I did was this 
two week training block where I did, I think I did 62 hours of training in two weeks. So that's two back to back thirties. And that was mostly zone two, but there were four interval sessions over the course of that two weeks. So two interval sessions per week. Um, and that's quite, you know, that's quite a, that's, that's the most training I've ever done in two weeks by far. Uh, I've done 30 hour weeks, bef- 30 hour individual weeks before, but I've never done back to back. And that was three weeks out from Unbound. And I felt, uh, I didn't have, it, Unbound, the mud really got to me and I got through the mud quite poorly. But after that, I I felt amazing during the race. And I, I thought that my fitness level for that race was was about as high as it could have possibly been. And I think if there's anything that I'm going to train change with my training this year after having that experience is perhaps incorporate more of those overreaching blocks. Interesting. Yeah. So in those in those weeks or just in general, who do you train with? Are you the are you the sort of the strongest guy that you train with or you do mostly solo or do you have high level, higher level training partner? Yeah. So where I live in Brevard, North Carolina, um, it's it's definitely a cycling town. There are a lot of, but it's mostly mountain bikers. There's a lot of mountain bikers, and I would say that if anything, we're probably more known for having some of the world's best downhill mountain bikers. Luca Shaw is from Brevard. Um, also, Nico Malali. I don't know if you, you guys even know who those two people are, but they're they're professional downhill mountain bikers at the World Cup level. Uh, very high level downhill mountain bikers and every single mountain biker, almost every mountain biker in Brevard is the kind of mountain biker that pedals real easy to the top, you know, smokes a joint, drinks a beer, and then just rips the downhill, right? That's, that's the kind of mountain bikers we're talking about. So there's less, there's less riders like me where I live, but there are a few. Um, I'm certainly the fastest gravel racer where i live but there there are still people to check train with that being said i would say i do 90 percent of 80 to 90 percent of my rides by myself and would those long endurance days would they be long endurance days on gravel uh i probably do so between road gravel and mountain biking in a typical training week i would probably say that 50 percent is on the road you know, 30% is on gravel and 20% is mountain bike. Have you ever considered moving full, full, like just not for two or three weeks, but living in Colorado in Boulder for a year? Have you considered that? Yeah, no, I'm constantly considering moving to Colorado for multiple reasons. But obviously one of the big reasons is because I would be so much closer to all the racing that I do. I mean, I I live on the East coast of the U S and I've only done two races on the East coast of the U S this year. All all of the other races have been West of the Mississippi river. Um, and obviously the other reason that you would want to move to Colorado if half the Grand Prix races are at altitude is because You've already got altitude acclimation built in. You know, you just already live there. Uh, I think that what would be challenging is that not every place at high altitude in the U.S., but a lot of high altitude places in the U.S. have quite harsh winters. And I hate spending time on the trainer. But a lot of a lot of pro pro riders who live in Colorado will go down to Arizona in the in the winter. Do you have um? Is do you have family in Bravad? What's What's uh, keeping you there? I mean, I I do genuinely like the area, and actually, the cycling is amazing there. Uh, the road cycling is amazing, the gravel cycling is amazing, and the mountain biking is probably the best mountain biking on the East Coast. Uh, there, this is the kind of area where you, it's the big city that I'm close to is Asheville, uh, but I'm about thirty minutes outside of Asheville, and. You could go on a five-hour road ride and only come across two stoplights, um, and it's it's quite good for doing intervals. I mean, I've got a thirty-minute climb. That's twenty. That's a twenty-minute bike ride from my house that I do almost all my intervals on, and it's a very steady, shallow grade. So, um, it's actually a great area for being a professional cyclist. 
uh, take out the altitude aspect. So uh, I have, do have a, another question, but just the reason why I was mainly asking is just like, you can go and look up studies and you think you can have everything dialed with training and stuff, but just what you, as you'd know, like what, what you can just pick up off other riders just subconsciously when you're getting to train with them, ride with them, just see little bits of what a whole heap of other good riders do. Like, you know, when I was teammates with Jay Vine and, or even, you know, Sam Hill, just all other kinds of riders and you just pick up little bits. It's, it'd be so hard to do on your, on your own pretty much, which sounds like you. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a, that is a great point. If I lived in Boulder, I mean, the amount of, the amount of professional cyclists in Boulder is insane. There'd be, there'd be plenty of fast riders to ride with all the time. So, uh, so you said, so five hour loop, two stop signs, you're doing five hours zone two. Are you podcasting music? Just sounds of the trees like Chris Miller? <laughs> uh, I switch. Yeah, no, I'm always listening to something. I almost never ride without headphones. Um, yeah, I, I switch between podcasts and music. Do you do little tricks with them? Do you start podcasts, finish with, finish with music? Uh, yeah, I mean, I do both. Sometimes I start with music, finish the podcast. Sometimes I start with podcast, finish with music. Sometimes I switch between the two. Um, I find it quite hard to listen to podcasts if it's if I'm, you know, going downhill or it's quite windy or on a flat road at a high speed. So sometimes what I do is I'll start the podcast on a climb that's going to take me 40 minutes and that's about enough time for a podcast. And then I'm then I switch to the music for the downhill. That's such a f foreign thing being in Sydney. Like I'll put I'll I'll do a podcast for this climb because it's so long. Our climbs are like eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one and a half songs. I think it's a family thing, Jesse. I was talking to my cousin yesterday and he was like, you know, I can't believe Jesse rides with headphones. He just like loves the sound of the birds and the cars and the, 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 every, the surround. That's someone that's not know. training enough. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's just us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, actually. honestly, he, if you're doing, a, if, if you were only doing a couple rides a week, uh, then yeah, I go out and enjoy nature, you know? Most of the time you're not enjoying nature, but there, there gets to be a point where it's like, I can only enjoy so much nature before I start going crazy. <laughs> Any other podcasts of podcasts of note that you're, that you are listening to? Do you, do you, do you go the full science route? Are you, are you a, a trainer road devotee? Like what's, 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 what's going on in the headphones? It, have you, so I, I'm assuming you haven't, uh, this is, this is off topic, but I'm assuming you haven't seen the the video that I did about trainer road. Oh no, no. I remember that. The thing about polarized training and how was that, 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 that whole storm in a teacup. Yeah. So, so trainer road is, is obviously another, uh, us, us based company. So I don't know how big trainer road is in They're Australia, big, yeah. but you, big. okay. It's big. Yeah. So that was probably one of my most controversial videos that I ever did, which is saying a lot because I have not most of my videos are not controversial, but there are some quite controversial ones on my channel. And that one was pro I, amongst the cycling community. That one was probably the most controversial because essentially what I was doing was I was calling out trainer road for having bad training plans. Um, and this is what I will say about that video after the fact. I don't take back one <laughs> thing that I said, and I am so proud that I made that video because the number of people that emailed me, DM'd me, wrote me, you know, I had to put an automatic reply on my email saying, I'm getting too many emails. I can't answer your email. I'm sorry. The, the amount of people that on, somewhere on the internet wrote that they got burnt out on Trainer Road, it's, it's probably in the thousands, and I'm not exaggerating on that. There were so many, it, it blew my mind. I mean, I was already, you know, I was already not a huge fan of the trainer road plans before I made that video. I did, I had listened to their podcast and I, I enjoyed listening to their podcast. But after I made that video, I was like, wow, that video needed to be made. I, we have a thing in Centennial Park where if we're, Chris and I are riding together, we can spot the people doing a trainer road workout. Not necessarily because of the intensity, but it's <laughs> they're doing something different every minute. It's like, oh, oh, and they're back, and then they're here, and then they're, they're doing steps, and it's just like, oh, my God, what what is this complexity? <laughs> you, can, you can see them. And, every, and, and these, these are not 
necessarily experienced riders and I you know you get sometimes I'll, I'll try and like see the Garmin and I don't know the amount of zones being displayed and the, the timing that you've got to be trying to spend in each zones I'm like holy shit how are you putting this together so I think that the biggest issue the complexity thing is obviously I'm not a huge fan of that but I think the biggest issue that I had was they're just over prescribing intensity I mean they're the high volume plan is intensity every single day for five five days a week and it's just there and and the what they what the trainer road fanboys always say is okay well if you can't handle the high volume plan then you got to go to the medium volume plan or the low volume plan it's like the high volume plan isn't even high volume so it's it's like 10 hours per week or something Mm. so you're telling somebody that they should just like if they can't handle 10 hours per 10 hours per week of intensity, but they have the time to ride 10 hours per week that they should just do less hours with all that intensity still like, but the pro I, I think their problem is because it's an indoor training software. So they would, they're not idiots. They would know that the plan doesn't make sense, but they're like, well, we can't just give someone on a trainer four zone two rides in an indoor training program because they're not going to want to follow it. So they end up doing well, more intensity and unnecessary complexity because it's an indoor training plan. But then it kind, of, but then by kind of lying about it, then yeah, they ended up making himself vulnerable to someone like you who just goes, "This does make makes no sense." Yeah, I mean, I feel like I call it. I, I feel like branding it as Trainer Road is kind of hamstringing themselves. How do you find the real the rule eight the rule twenty eight stuff? Out of yeah, no, I I love it and the. So rule 28 is uh, my kit sponsor and how I got hooked up with them is that I I was a big fan of their aero socks and obviously I'm a marginal gains nerd and rule 28 is very heavily focused on aerodynamics. They've, you know, they are, they're constantly wind tunnel testing their skin suits and their socks and all of that. Um, but they weren't a sponsor of mine, uh, but I was wearing their socks and I think in a video... I was talking about how much of a difference aero socks make and I didn't even as explicitly name rule 28 but I did have a clip of me wearing the socks and you can see the logo and and they reached out to me and they were like wow we got you know we had so many sales after that video or something I forget exactly what they said but um that kind of started this relationship with them and I couldn't yeah I couldn't be happier with their with their kits. Um, so is your custom kit, is that their road, is that their road suit or is it the, so does it, do you have to, do you wear the base layer underneath it? Yeah. So I, I'll either go with the road race skin suit, which doesn't yep. use the base layer, or I'll go with the, the Neo suit, which does use the base layer. Does and it. that's the three quarter length sleeve, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. So yep. Because it's a little bit longer sleeve and you have to wear a base layer, some of these gravel races are very hot. Unbound is a great example. It can be very hot in that race. And dealing with the heat is a huge part of doing well in that race. And anything that you can do to not overheat is beneficial. Uh, I, w- I wouldn't be wearing that skin suit for that race because I want to. I, I want the most cooling possible. So I'll go with the road race skin suit instead. But if it's a cool yep. race, I'll go with the Neo suit and it's a little bit faster. Yeah, I've I've run the three quarter length one. That's so that's the Neo suit with the um and I, I ran that ran that at Grafton. The the only I actually really like the the quality of the stuff as well. The only thing I found with it is the sizing can be a bit funky. So I kinda had to actually send so I got a chance to ride the road race skin suit, which I think's like you said, the one that you run the most most of the time. But that was bizarrely big on me so like over over the knees type type length on it yeah the the leg length is a little bit long um i don't really mind it i i think it i think the fit is good but if you're used to a normal bib leg length the leg length of the bibs on the skin suit is a bit longer than you probably typically have all right guys i think we might wrap it up um dylan thank you so much for your time and uh good luck in the final Lifetime Grand Prix event, which is? It's uh, Big Sugar, gravel race in Arkansas. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, I really appreciate awesome. you having me on. Um, this was a lot of fun. It was awesome. We'll we'll maybe do it again at the end of, end of the season. Have a bit of a, a recap of the whole thing. Uh, JC, thank you very much for your time. And guys, we will Sounds see great. you real soon. Thanks, guys.